safety uh, vaccines for adults throughout your life. Well, there's no way that the brain can tolerate 115 repetitive vaccinations. So it's not necessarily the mercury. The mercury adds to the toxicity, but it's the fact that the brain is being overstimulated immunologically. Sure. And that's proven. And uh, they also recently announced a new Army plan to develop DNA vaccines, uh, which would use an electrostimulation process and supposedly go directly to the cells. And it would also, part of the project would be so they could deliver multiple vaccines in one quick blast, not have to use new needles for everyone, so they could do things fairly quickly. Uh, but do you have any idea what the potential dangers would be of DNA vaccines? Well, it is an area that they're looking into uh, so that they can give it in, in fewer vaccination exposures. And that's because uh, they have difficulty getting people to keep coming in and getting these dozens and dozens of vaccines. So it'd be a lot more convenient just to give one. But you're still immunologically stimulating uh, the body in a very, very powerful way over a prolonged period of time. If you do that in animals, it damages the brain. If you do that in animals that are young or during pregnancy, it will reproduce things like schizophrenia or autism. Sure. And we know in women, pregnant women, if uh, during their pregnancy they develop a viral infection, the incidence of schizophrenia and autism goes up tremendously in their offspring as they get older. Of course, schizophrenia doesn't present until their teenage years. So there's a, there's a long period between the vaccination and the appearance of the schizophrenia, which gave a deniability for a long period of time. Well, the new research has shown it's not the virus that's causing the schizophrenia. It's the mother's immune reaction to the virus. So when her immune system is activated, it activates the baby's brain's immune system and produces a process called immunoexcitotoxicity that produces abnormal brain development and the schizophrenia and autism. When you stimulate the body's immune system, it automatically activates the brain's immune system, which is a separate immune system. It's operated by the microglia-type brain cell. When that brain cell is activated during a natural infection, it's activated, kills the virus or bacteria, and then it shuts down. If you immunologically activate it by giving injections, like you do with a vaccine, it turns it on and it doesn't turn off very well. You give another vaccine a month later, two months later, that cell becomes hyperreactive. So the next reaction is infinitely more intense than the first one. So the brain stays in this state of chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation of the brain is what's thought to lead to such diseases in adults like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig disease, Huntington's disease. Uh, and in infants and small children, it leads to neurodevelopmental problems, difficulty learning, ADD, ADHD. I think recently on the news, they talked about the link between pesticides and ADHD. Well, the interesting thing, pesticides do the same thing as vaccines do. They activate this microglia immune cell in the brain. So what the pesticide is doing chemically is the same thing that the vaccine does during the injection. That is, it produces chronic brain inflammation, leading to ADHD, autism, schizophrenia, and sets you up later in life for chronic brain degeneration. Uh, this is the thing that's well dis demonstrated in the scientific literature, particularly the neuroscience literature, but being totally ignored uh, by the media, by health authorities, by regulatory agencies, by the people promoting vaccine. They're completely keeping this silent and away from the general public so that mothers and people getting these multiple vaccinations vaccination do not know the danger that's inherent in this practice. And if you look back at, at what Dr. Kay is saying in her book on molecular biology, uh, that in 1910 this was the dream uh, of these elitists, was to recreate uh, man in the image of the, of the elitist idea. And it was funded uh, by enormous amounts of money from the tax-free foundations, uh, which hide what they're doing with other types of philanthropy. 
So if they uh, are using their money for art museums and education programs and things that, that have a lot of public appeal, then underneath that they can hide these other things that they're doing. Uh, and then if they are exposed by someone, then they say, oh, well, we're promoting these vaccine programs in Africa because we care about these poor people and we're trying to, to protect them against these diseases. Uh, or we're, we're doing this fluoridation program because we're interested in people's, uh, the health of their teeth. So it's easy to hide the true motivation of, of what you're doing. Now, do we have the smoking gun that proves this is what they're doing? Well, we don't have the the exact smoking gun, because they're smarter than that. They're not going to put it exactly in writing. But when you look at the writings of the Rockefellers uh, and the, the Ford Foundation, uh, they hint at these things, that population needs to be controlled, uh, that we need to re-engineer uh, human thinking and behavior. Uh, so if, if they're in uh, favor of social engineering, if they're in favor of this science of man idea of remaking uh, the human mind, uh, it, it's, it's a pretty strong indication that they will use their enormous power, influence, and enormous amounts of money in conjunction uh, with pharmaceutical companies and others to bring these, these ideas about. You know, I find it, it, it ironic when people uh, say they don't believe in, in certain conspiracy theories. Well, it's like H.G. Wells wrote his book. The title of his book is Open Conspiracy. Because it's not secret, and this is what you usually hear is, well, if this was true, how could they keep it secret? Well, they don't need to keep it secret. And it's not a secret because they write a lot about it. Uh, they write about the need for control in these different areas. They write about how the, we need to control behavior and how we need to re-engineer man. Uh, so it's in their writings, it's an open conspiracy, but they can keep uh, people from making that final link because they never actually say uh, exactly how they're doing it and what they're doing. It's just they fund it. You look for the funding behind uh, things like fluoridation, and you look for funding behind uh, some of these other efforts, and it always goes back to the tax-free foundations uh, are, are uh, the driving force behind it and they're producing the justification for it by hiding it behind benevolent uh, uh, claims. Brave New World Revisited was about methods that then were known to control human behavior. Uh, you know, Huxley talked about uh, uh, strobotic injection in which you gave some mild psychotropic drugs to the population and you could inject thoughts into their, their minds and they would think they thought. And suddenly you would change their whole way of thinking without their knowledge. So he was writing about this in 1950s. Uh, so that's, that's one book. H.G. Uh, Wells wrote about it. Uh, we have a number of people who were writing about the chemical alteration of the brain to change human thinking uh, on a mass scale. Uh, so it's not a new idea, and unfortunately there are people who believe that's true. Now, this new move to put uh, psychotropic drugs into the water supply, for instance lithium, uh, should scare people. Uh, you know, they have no right uh, to put psychotropic, mind-altering drugs in the water supply. It's very dangerous for one thing. Uh, we know lithium can accumulate in the brain. We know that in some people it can produce serious neurological disorders. Uh, we know uh, that if you're, <clears throat> for instance, on lithium medication, does that mean you can't drink your tap water? Because the, the therapeutic dose is very close to the toxic dose. So that we're going to have to supply special water to them. What do you do for small children? What do you do for babies? What do you do for pregnant women? They can't drink the water supply because it's going to have a very profound effect on a small baby's brow. And none of this is being considered. Well, then other people are already stepping forward. Well, not only should we add lithium to the water supply to prevent suicide and depression, we should add other drugs to the water. Uh, there's a British physician who said we ought to add statin drugs and antihypertensives to all water. Well, then there's other psychiatrists and, and people interested in human behavior who say, well, I, you know, there's other drugs we could alter human behavior with. Well, I, I don't think we need elitist 
scientists or technocrats, as you say, uh, altering our thinking by putting things in our, in our water supply. Uh, that's the drugging of America on a mass scale for these elitists uh, to manipulate our minds. And they have no idea what it is. I mean, look at the fluoride program, for instance. Uh, here it started out, it's very safe, it's very benign. Now, uh, uh, 60 years later, we find out, well, no, it's increased cancer rates 10%. It makes tumors grow faster. It increases bone fractures. It produces reproductive problems. What's one of the major things that's just exploded since I've been in medical school is infertility in young people. Fertility clinics are everywhere. Young people are having trouble uh, conceiving. And no one has a scientific explanation other than these things that are being added to water and food, and et cetera, that are known to affect human reproduction. This is another one of those uh, living constitution rights where, where the, the left says, well, it's not in the constitution. It was not proposed by the framers of the constitution. It was not part of the contract between the state and the federal government, but we've inserted it on our own without any vote, without any constitutional methods of adding an amendment, we just decided it would be good for society to do this. And therefore, we'll do it. And if later we find out we've created a tragedy, then, well, that's just the price of, uh, that you have to pay. Uh, it, you know, it reminds me of uh, when Malcolm Muggeridge was traveling uh, to the Ukraine during the great Ukrainian starvation Im imposed by Stalin. Uh, he was riding on the train with a reporter from the New York Times, and the dead bodies were just piled up like cordwood everywhere. A and uh, uh, Malcolm Muggeridge was just shocked. He said, I, I can't believe what Stalin is doing. And he turned to the New York Times reporter, Walter Durante, and he said, aren't you shocked by this? And he says, oh, well, you have to break some eggs to make an omelet. We're building a new society. Well, this is their idea. This is their same uh, uh, viewpoint. Is that, oh yes, we may, we may harm a lot of people, we may kill some babies, we may create some new diseases, uh, you know, we may uh, wipe out whole populations at a time, but that's the price we have to pay to create the new vision, the new society. Uh, and these people admit it in many of their writings, if you, if you take the time to read these things. For instance, uh, one of the, uh, the great ophthalmologist, I, I've forgotten his name now, I think it was Wise, but he was a, an ophthalmologist back in the 1950s. And uh, one of the greatest, they still give an award in his name. <clears throat> and uh, he wanted to euthanize anybody who was blind. It always starts with the worst case scenario. And he said, well, it's terrible that people are born blind. Therefore, what we'll do is we'll sterilize all families that had blind children so they can't have any more blind children. Well, then other ophthalmologists came forward and said, well, 99% of blindness has nothing to do with heredity. He was going to sterilize all blind people, so none of them could have children. Uh, well, then he carried it even further. He said, well, anyone with impaired vision should be sterilized. And then it became anyone who wears glasses should be sterilized. So we always see this progression. It starts out with a worst case scenario to sell it to the public because the public uh, uh, feelings of sympathy and empathy uh, are easily engendered when you pull this little child that has this horrible disease. And you say, we need to do this so that this doesn't ever happen. And then you approve that. And then the next thing you know, we're, we're killing people who are, just have minor problems. Uh, I call it the Kevorkian progression. Uh, if you remember Kevorkian in the beginning, oh, it's people who have terminal diseases. They're going to die soon. Why let them suffer? Well, most people said, well, that makes sense. I don't, I don't think people should suffer. Then, oh, well, they're not going to die anytime soon, but they have a disease that's crippling, and it's not nice to have to live like that, so he killed them. Well, then people started saying, well, I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, you know, they can live with that condition. They should just not be able to do everything they'd like to. Well, where did it end up? Then he was killing a woman because she was depressed. So there's always this progression. It starts out with a worst case scenario to sell it because of its, its power of empathy. 
And then once it's sold and becomes legislation and a law, then we start including